uh, morning or a very good afternoon. Thanks very much for this kind introduction. Actually, it's a pleasure and an honor to have this keynote uh, lecture on this topic. So here you see the title, Tissue Engineering, we, we grow with our needs. So um, it's an interesting title and I hope I can uh, give you some good overview. I don't take the title personal, to be honest. And um, yeah, let's see how we go in the field of tissue engineering. So let's deal first of all with the clinical problem and I think this is um, very clear. We have valvular heart disease out there with currently about 300,000 valve replacements all over the world and um, I don't need to bore you with the clinical problem in terms of limited durability and progressive degeneration. Um, we know if it comes to mechanical heart valves, we deal with lifelong anticoagulation. We know when we implant a bioprosthesis, we deal with degeneration and at best the, for example, Edwards Perrymount now looking at 22 year follow up, but we can do better. And then the problem, um, how do we deal with younger patients? And most importantly, you may be aware of the recent tablet trials, also so Tavi and partner uh, to be where we look into an extension of indication towards younger and mid-risk patients. Then we have the big field of congenital heart disease, which is uh, also of high importance because here we have the fundamental problem of growth and how do we deal with that when the uh, patient or the child is outgrowing the prosthesis requiring reoperation. So first of all this, I think we would all agree on a clear need that we need something that is able or capable to repair, to regenerate and to provide growth capaci capacity. So what's about all that with regenerative medicine? And uh, here you see the original science cover from 93. So this is nothing completely new. This is out there a while. We are, um, we are looking at about 25 years or even more on that. And actually Langer and Vacanti, here you see that in the content, um, were reporting on tissue engineering in 93 the principles and the overall paradigm. And you see also on the cover, maybe it's hard to read, even at that time they dealt uh, very intense with biologically based therapies such as gene and cell therapy. So regenerative therapy is something that is out there for, for many years and obviously we had some issues also in translating these technologies into clinics. And then also the PNS journal, 10 years later, put that on its prestigious cover page. Here you see regenerative medicine as uh, named uh, the term, so to speak. This was in 2003. And nowadays it's all over the place. When we look at um, different disciplines, and here I have just assembled a couple of pictures to um, illustrate that, we look into uh, skin uh, regeneration, nerve regeneration. We have a lot of um, programs running in the abdominal space. We also deal with lungs, lung regeneration, and obviously also in the cardiovascular field, such as with grafts, valves, cardiac patches, and classical cell therapy. When we quickly look into the paradigm, what's um, basically the key or cornerstones of such approaches, we basically have four parts. We obviously deal with cells. These cells can be of different origin, as you see. They can be autogenic or autologous, they can be allogenic and also xenogenic even, right, from animals. And then we deal with scaffolds, and um, this is uh, where I was uh, busy quite a while in my life at the Technical University in Eindhoven when dealing um, with different scaffold materials, understanding how we can use them to uh, induce regeneration in combination with cells. And then there's something that we call the in vitro culture or the uh, conditioning phase. This is like if you were going to a mar marathon, you have to train. You cannot just run right away. You have to train. And that's a sim similar situation as for our prosthesis here. So we put the cells onto the scaffold and then we train this prosthesis to put it into the body. And in the field of um, cardiovascular medicine, we basically deal with heart valves, blood vessels, but also classical cardiac cell therapy. I will not go into this uh, issue today, but it's also feasible to inject cells into the myocardium, and you know that from the yellow press with mixed results at the moment. So the question for today is, can we engineer regenerative prosthesis for structural and congenital heart repair? And here you see a cover page from a uh, journal in Nature in 2011, where they were naming it Taking Tissue Engineering to the Heart. So I think it's a good title to start off. 
When we look into um, the past and also the future, it's also quite interesting that Dr. Harkin, a um, pioneer in heart valve surgery, even in the 1950s and then uh, in uh, 89, actually summarized um, what is fundamental when we design such prostheses. And um, he basically summarized, of course, they have to be durable, they have to have absence of any thrombogenicity, they need to be resistant to infections, they have to have the lack of antigenicity, and importantly, the potential for growth. So basically what he was stating were the fundamental properties of living and autologous tissues. In this context, in the uh, early 90s, we started the Zurich Tissue Engineering Heart Valve Program uh, that actually my boss and um, yeah, long-standing mentor, Simon Hurstow, brought back from Boston into Zurich. And here you see a bunch of publications and, and work we have performed in the different fields over the years. And this was important to us because not only to prove that this is a valid strategy, but also to understand what does not work that good and what um, we would rather omit to translate into clinics. Then um, I would say in 2010, we uh, changed directions from the bench in vitro towards more in vivo assessments. We have a big clinical, a preclinical platform in Zurich, and we extensively assess those technologies also in the preclinical setting as a prerequisite to clinical translation. Um, here you see the overall principle, how that works, and I have outlined that in the paradigm, but in the setting of the heart valve, the ideal approach or the, 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 the initial approach, so to speak, was the isolation of autologous cells, and we have the next speaker up here uh, in a second talking about that in more detail, and then we culture those cells, we put them on the scaffold, put them into the bioreactor, and then we have the valve out there after a couple of weeks to be implanted into the patient, or as, we, as you see here on the video, on the right side, into a sheep model. This was a very first implantation of such a valve using a transcatheter approach, basically a very simple approach, just a tube and uh, crimp the valve into the tube and then pushing it out into the pulmonary circulation. But it worked. And, um, it was a good start for us to understand that this is an approach to, uh, that uh, actually uh, qualifies for further investigation. However, we have to say in this study we um, encountered a phenomenon that we called at that time leaflet thickening and retraction. So obviously, although there were these cells and these stem cells seated on these scaffolds, um, obviously there was a problem with the remodeling, or at least we could not control it that much to avoid such uh, problems. And as you can imagine, thickening is nothing you want to have in your valve in terms of stenosis, and also the retraction was a big issue in terms of its insufficiency. Further, um, obviously this is a three to six week approach, so is that really viable for clinics? I leave that with a question mark and we can discuss about that. There are translational challenges, and I think this is we have to understand when we have a beautiful research project, but then want to bring it into a valid uh, clinical therapy. Obviously, what we need from this initial uh, concept that was described by Langer and Vacanti is logistical simplification, and we need to understand guided valve remodeling to ensure long-term functionality, because this is why we are doing this at the very end. So this is the slide, actually, um, where you came uh, for today, I would say. Cardiovascular tissue engineering towards simplified logistics. It's a busy slide, but it summarizes actually where we are in the field, and I'll try to quickly sum it up for you. We at the moment deal with a very promising uh, um, situation. This is the allogenic and xenogenic tissues. I think we have a speaker here, uh, Dr. Hawker from Hanover. This is also, or equals also the Hanover approach. and. Um, these guys have done impressive work with the ISPOA program and also the ARISE program on the aortic valve. And um, there's also another company out there called Matrix you heard about that uh, has shown very promising results in, um, in the, the right heart system. But we have to say um, we will see over the time how this will develop on the aortic position. And I think there was a recent um, also critical article from the Mayo Clinic questioning the long-term durability of such aortic valves. And um, the ARISE consortium responded very nicely to that, saying also that desolarization and also the, uh, let's say, mechanistic preparation of such prostheses does matter. So, I think it's important to understand um, deceleration of aortic valves. Only time will tell. I very much like this um, editorial, I have to say. 
because it is really at the end telling us the clinical route for this approach. Then we have synthetic biodegradable polymers, something completely different, something kind of science fiction. You design a polymer in the lab, and this polymer is so smart that when you put it into the body, it attracts the right cells at the right time and tells the cells what to express and what to express in terms of phenotyping. So a pretty interesting approach, very simple, because you can make those scaffolds in an abundant availability. And actually, there's a trial out there on pulmonary conduits um, that is uh, sponsored by a company named Celtis. And they have just recently presented quite interesting results for Fontan patients with up to two years. But also here, we need longer follow-ups, obviously. And then there's something I would say maybe the two uh, things of both worlds, or the best of both worlds, what we call hybrid scaffolds, so to speak, extracellular matrices that can be engineered and then implant it into the body uh, to regenerate into living heart valves or grafts. This is an approach that is also not completely new. Laura Nicholson, a very uh, famous bioengineer from the US, uh, recently performed a clinical trial here in uh, hemodialysis shunts in patients that was published in The Lancet just recently, showing that this is also a, a valid clinical strategy to follow. So let's dive into the issue um, with engineered extracellular matrices. And this is a topic we have been uh, dealing with for many years in Zurich now. So basically what we uh, do, we perform our engineered valve approach and then at the very last step we take away the cells and just leave behind the extracellular matrix. So one may argue, why are you doing that? Why do you put cells at all? And this is a question we will discuss in more detail throughout my talk. So first of all, in terms of logistics, this is a significant simplification to previous autologous tissue engineering approaches and it, at least to us, appears to be a good valid alternative to um, homographs and even xenografts. It comes with a good self-repair capacity and may have a potential for growth. We are currently exploring that. And um, this is why we think this is a valid approach to go for. Here you see a study I want to share with you we did um, at the University of Cape Town with these valves um, because apart from the sheep model that is the accepted, uh, yeah, so to speak, worst case scenario model also accepted by the FDA, we wanted to test such valves in a model that is very close to human physiology. And this is why we went with this primate animal model, um, supposed to have a good high regenerative potential, to really test in terms of resolarization and in terms of remodeling and self-repair capacity of such approaches. And I can tell you I was the guy who had to do the implants. And as you see here nicely on the uh, imagery, these animals are live animals, so you better double check when you implant those uh, animals so you make sure they sleep appropriately. Um, so um, we, we implanted those valves, actually. And uh, here on the right side, you see um, the typical data set we always provide for all our studies. So we uh, assess in very detail what is the degree of uh, cellularization, what is the um, phenotype of repopulating cells, because this is also extremely important, not just that the cells are there. You also need to understand what kind of cells enter the scaffold and when and how. We also look for endothelialization. You see that here on the right side. And what was striking to us, actually, was um, you see here this graphic. We checked what is the degree of resolarization, not only on histological levels, because this can hamper at some uh, extent. We tried to understand on biochemical analysis what is the degree of DNA that we can find in these valves to really prove that there is a high degree of resolarization. And how does that compare to a native valve, for example, in such an animal. And here you see, even after eight weeks in our implanted valves that had no cell on it, just the extracellular matrix, we saw a high degree of resolarization in the very early phase. Of course, you may say and you may argue for every regeneration process you need inflammation. This was a lot of inflammatory cells at the beginning. But this is important that your scaffold is also capable to take these cells on to really transform into a living tissue. A good collagen formation, a good endothelialization, so a pretty valid approach. And this brought us then further also to assess against a um, decellarized cryopreserved homograph. Here the recellarization was rather low in the direct comparison considering this high repopulating animal such a primate. 
We took that further into an uh, EU project. This is the EU FP7 LifeBuff project that was um, ended two years ago. And we performed a six-month translational sheep study. So we took this uh, very good results from the primates towards the sheep in order to understand, do we see the same phenomena? And I can tell you, every animal has uh, advantages, but also disadvantages in terms of really understanding uh, remodeling and regeneration. And here we also saw a high degree of um, rapid and homogeneous repopulation. But um, what we also saw was again a problem that obviously the cells that entered the uh, scaffold um, transformed into what we call alpha SMA contracting cell types that pulled on the leaflets. And you can imagine what happens then when the leaflets shorten, you got insufficiency. And this is a problem we were dealing probably for the couple of years or the last five years to um, address that to make those valves functional. And we were going back to the bench to understand what is exactly the cell phenotype and what um, basically guides those cells to transform into a contracting cell type and to um, present this retraction and shortening. So one thing that is very obvious, and if you heard about that, is um, the hemodynamics, right, uh, obviously, and also the flow pattern on the valve on how the scaffold and how the cells are pushed into these scaffolds and exposed in the uh, pulmonary or even systemic circulation. So we took a new approach. Um, this is what we call the Life Valve 2.0, the, uh, the reloaded approach, where we applied computational modeling to develop a rather rational heart valve design. So we inform the scaffold how it has to look in terms of geometry and how it has to be shaped into such a stent design to really ensure that we can guide the uh, regeneration and remodeling of the valve and we can even predict how the cells will align and how the cells will form the final valve. And this we investigated in a one year long term follow up analysis in sheep. You can imagine this was a very costly experiment to really prove that by that as controlled by clinically grade imaging such as uh, echo or MRI, we were able to achieve a very good long-term durability of such valve according to ISO norms for heart valves in principle. So I can't uh, show you uh, more on that because this is currently under review, but this is just a teaser that even this big standing problem for leaflet retraction and negative remodeling is currently being challenged by us in a consortium and we have a good solution for that. As said, 12 months in sheep, this accounts for about six years in humans, considering the fact that um, they have a much higher cell and calcific metabolism. So also clinical translation may be uh, visible in the near future for such an approach. We also, um, in parallel, taking this a step further, um, here you see a paper we published, let's see, uh, in 2014, actually, where we transferred such an approach already into the aortic uh, circulation. And on the right side, you see um, how we have such an extracellular matrix-based uh, regenerative TAVI um, built and actually put into the systemic circulation in first proof of concept studies. And we have currently going on a long-term study in Zurich to see if we also can transfer this to the aortic side. Another project I want to um, quickly uh, put your focus on is, as said, um, a very tempting approach, an in situ approach, and I think we will hear on uh, such scaffolds in more detail by, by one speaker. This is another AU FP7 that we have currently running. It's called Intelligent Materials for in situ Heart Valve Tissue Engineering, the IMA valve here. This will be a very um, tempting approach, just putting in a smart scaffold that then should attract the right cells at the right time to transform into a heart valve. We are currently in first animal experiments, so we will see where that brings us. What's out there as well? Another project we have been involved, and this is uh, relating also to uh, bioresorbable uh, so-called supramolecular polymer-based valves. This is pretty much the same what Xeltis is doing. You also see they were part in this consortium here on the left side. 
where we tested those valves also in a transcatheter fashion on the pulmonary end, and we followed those valves up for one year, showing a very good um, functionality. However, I have to say personally, my problem with this approach was that after one year, there was still a lot of scaffold all over, all over the place, which makes it hard to judge what happens when the scaffold is completely resolved and is the body completely taking over uh, the function of this uh, new built tissue. This is for sure a good thing in congenital applications considering the very high regenerative potential, but what if we translate that to older patients with multimorbidity or other um, health conditions and when the regeneration potential is a bit hampered. Finally, another good project that is running, we also published here together with our friends at uh, the Wies Institute at Harvard, and what we call rotary jet spinning manufacturing for heart valves. So we can basically spin the extracellular matrix as I have presented it to you, and we can make those heart valves actually in less than three minutes, abundantly in any size, in any uh, form you want to have it. And we are currently evaluating this approach against our benchmark um, in the bioreactor, and it looks very promising in this regard. So this is also in terms of upscaling and uh, translation into a clinical setting, a very interesting approach. Future directions, we also look into, into, into intrauterine approaches. We have a project out there, this is also published, where we replaced heart valves in a minimally invasive or transcatheter fashion in unborn sheep. Here you see some of this uh, imagery, um, and it appears to us that uh, this is also working. Uh, we do this also for another reason, because of course the fetus has a high regeneration potential. It's the perfect model to study recellularization and remodeling in the unborn. Finally, I would like to um, put your attention to another topic. This is uh, tissue-engineered vascular grafts. Uh, they follow, of course, the similar principle as for the valves. And in 2011, actually, we had already approval to go with these grafts into clinics. Uh, the Heart Center in Leipzig was eager to do so. And this was a fully autologous approach with all the five to six week bioreactor uh, phase. And this actually was based on a uh, study that we had performed in sheep for up to five years. So here, while it was about growth, we wanted to understand um, are these grafts capable to grow? And for this, we had to take young lambs and follow them for up to five years to really um, replicate the complete childhood and see does this material has the capacity for growth? And the data were pretty tempting and, and encouraging. And as said, um, 4.5 years in sheep account for about 25 years in humans. So that was a very translational, very costly study. I can tell you my boss at the end uh, named the last sheep that we explanted at five years the one million dollar of Frank sheep because this was the price we had to pay for this single animal considering that we were doing such a long follow-up. But anyways, we got the approval into clinics then in 2011 or 12, but we did not move forward, and why? So everybody was awaiting us, why um, are they not going into clinic with that? And although we are from rich Switzerland, I have to tell you it was 100,000 K to produce such a graft, right? And then it, has to be, it had to be timed to the perfect day actually, considering that the child does not get sick and the surgeon is set up with a surgery for that day. But what if there's any issue, then we could throw the graft back in the bin. And this is certainly nothing you can, uh, you can make viable as an approach uh, for clinical translation. So actually we did no translation, although the data were very good and went back to the lab to think about how can we do these things better in terms of logistics and costs to become a viable market strategy. And this is uh, what we are currently doing at the Wies Translational Center Zurich. This is a project I quickly want to draw your attention to. This is the Zurich Life Matrix project where we basically have built a platform on human engineered tissues for the regeneration of the heart to simplify such methodologies towards clinical application. And here you see the team. It's a very interdisciplinary team, which I'm uh, the project leader of. And uh, we are obliged not only to drive this technology forward, but also to make it a viable strategy to be implemented in our healthcare systems. 
This is the platform, and you see, um, basically, we deal with our extracellular matrix-based uh, approach. We deal with children uh, in terms of growth and regeneration, but we also deal with adults uh, in terms of um, regenerative or self-repair capacity materials, young patients that may require heart valves, also peripheral vascular grafts, and other applications. How did we do better in comparison to the autologous approach? By implementing basically two steps. We have omitted the autologous approach. We go with master cell banks, as you see here in the figure on the right side. So we take the umbilical cord as a very rich cell source. And as mentioned, as the, as the very last step, we uh, perform a desolarization and a lyophilization step in order to make these prostheses off the shelf ready, shippable all over the world. And by that, we achieve cost cut by up to 50 times. That means 100,000 versus probably a two to 5,000 at the moment to produce such materials. Here you see, um, we had to go back to the uh, preclinical testing pipeline as well. This is uh, from an animal trial that is not published yet, uh, where you actually see up to 12 months where we use those grafts to replace uh, the pulmonary artery with very similar results to what we have seen to our autologous approach. Very good functionality. You also see the tissue, how it looks like after 12 months, just macroscopically. So unremarkable and very comparable to what we had before with the autologous approach. What about growth? And this is obviously a very critical thing because how do we define growth, right? How do we make sure that it's just not dilatation or aneurysm formation or dehiscence or any other phenomena? And we looked into that in very detail. So we followed the lamps here. Um, very closely doing CT analysis and also echocardiography to really see what is the diameter but also the overall volume in these grafts and how does that relate to the native tissue. And in our model here we could display a growth potential from 1.6 centimeter as uh, per implant in diameter up to 2.0 centimeter at 52 weeks accounting for about 25% in terms of growth. So pretty encouraging, but still needs further validation, and it's the question, does that translate when we go into children's application? Initiation of a clinical pilot trial is underway, obviously actually starting right now. We are starting to talk again to the authorities to move that forward. Here you also see how such graphs look like. As you see also, we have a huge um, effort put into that in terms of production and quality control. We have a fully GMP-grade manufacturing environment uh, back in Zurich, which is following the ISO compliance. And as of now, we have probably produced about 350 clinical-grade grafts to be potentially implanted into children, and we are doing further. This is uh, the clinical team, actually, that will uh, lead the first uh, clinical application, our very good colleagues and supporters from the Children's Hospital in Zurich, uh, that will do the uh, clinical pilot trial, hopefully to start then beginning of next year. And we have a lot of um, regulatory support also from the uh, different clinical trial centers then in Zurich in this uh, environment. So clinical translation, to sum it up. Um, actually, it's always interesting. You have your basic science discovery, and you have all these experimental things out there. But obviously, the most challenging thing is the translation. And even if you strongly believe in your concept and you are totally convinced that's the best, you always have to admit and you have to review carefully, is that really feasible to be translated into a clinical setting? In Zurich, we were very lucky because also we have the translational in infrastructure to do so. So we have a hybrid animal for uh, hybrid OR for animals. We have clean room facilities, GMP facilities to really replicate a clinically relevant scenario when developing such things and testing such things. We are also, as me being myself a clinician, it is very important that we have a constant crosstalk with the clinicians, also to um, reconsider all the time and continuously carefully, is that really feasible what I'm doing there or do I have any roadblock in my production plan when I go with these regenerative technologies? 
In Zurich, as said, we have all that in walking distance, which makes it a really strong site for biotech and bioengineering approaches and development. Very proud to be part of that. And I think this is the way to go also when you look into the Boston area and many other areas, also Berlin here, I was quite impressed to see what's available in terms of really doing clinical translation. Finally, my last slide. Translational challenges in regenerative medicine, lessons learned. I think there are a lot of scientific issues. You have to prove your concept and uh, you have to have preclinical validation. Predictability and efficacy is key because it translates into clinical safety. But you should not underestimate the logistical issues. I've been doing this for probably 10 years and I faced a lot of logistical challenges, although we were 150% uh, convinced and validated with our scientific approach. So this is something very, very critical. Clinical issues, safety and patient selection, here the keyword, for example, core matrix, works beautiful on the right heart, failed in the mitral valve field, or other high pressure um, applications, right? And then regulatory issues, I just wrote a uh, review on that. It's a nightmare. Understand from the very beginning what is my regulatory pathway to bring these devices and approaches into clinics. And if there's one thing I have learned throughout this journey, that it's a two-way direction principle. Tissue engineered vascular grafts for the use in the treatment of congenital heart disease. From the bench to the clinic, and very often also back again. Thank you very much.